when I was 11, and he was possessed by the devil. A bizarre murder trial gets underway tomorrow. The devil made me do it. I said, why am I here? And he said, well, you just killed your friend. The nature of our defense has never been used in the United States is demonic possession. But the tale really begins at the end of this driveway, where the Brookfield couple, whose 11-year-old son, began acting strangely. You can feel something watching you. We didn't believe him at first. David said this entity spoke. He told David he wants his soul today. Ladies and gentlemen, the ghost hunters, Ed and Lorraine Warren. From the historic haunted heartland of Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, young and old, to this episode of the world-famous Necronomicast. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome to the show for a late-night conversation all the way from Scotland, tonight through Wires of Infinity, filmmaker Christopher Holt. Christopher is here to talk to us about his brand new Netflix documentary, The Devil on Trial. It's all about the Glatzel family and their alleged interaction with evil spirits that resulted in the nation's first trial to ever use demonic possession as a defense. Filmmaker Christopher Holt here on Necronomicast. And now calling in on the Newsmaker Hotline, all the way from Scotland, it's my pleasure to have on the show filmmaker, writer-director, Chris Holt. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. It's amazing that you're in Scotland and I'm in Omaha. I see it's nighttime where you're at. It's it's broad daylight <laughs> where I'm at. It's great to make this connection. And it's cold. It's so cold here. It's unbelievable. Ah, it's beautiful here. It's like 68, a beautiful fall day. Wow. Wow. No, that's a distant <laughs> memory now. Our summers are long gone. Ah, uh, well, I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. I've been familiar with the case uh, that you that you portray in your new documentary on Netflix entitled The Devil on Trial. Uh, I saw an old TV movie years ago called uh, The Demon Murder Case, uh, the Conjuring film about the case. And really, I'm familiar with a lot of the cases that were written about and popularized by Ed and Lorraine Warren. So to have you, uh, a filmmaker of your caliber, on what a what a treat to discuss this case with you. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the Warrens as well. They are incredibly interesting couple, and I don't, you know, I don't think that they knew when they started all this that it would create this world, this universe that they have done. Yeah, I don't think they imagine the amount of money that their cases could generate. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Given the right, given the right uh, creative uh, outlet for them. So what yeah. led you as a filmmaker, and you've got an impressive resume that I was reading over at your website, Christopher Holt, online. And what led you down this road of tackling this case? What led you to the history of this case? What led you to it? I, yeah, I was approached to make the film uh, way back in 2022. Um, and actually, it was the end of 2021. And initially, I had no interest whatsoever in in making a paranormal film because most paranormal films set out to, to prove, you know, that, that something really did happen, that something really did exist. And there was never there was never that idea there. The, the whole idea for the film was, you know, to speak to the three brothers, to really analyze the facts and to lay out the facts as we as we knew them to be via you know what they said it was um it was it was the first time that this was going to be done like you said there's been a couple of films and there's been a documentary made about this but never have they spoken to the brothers and actually got the story from the horse's mouth um so that was the real challenge and i just thought I couldn't really turn it down i was i'm a horror fan anyway i love I do love horror films um, and I've watched The Conjuring and I just wanted to really unpick what actually happened in that case. I know with the marketing, it's called The Devil on Trial and it's a remarkable case. But what, what you just said a second ago really resonated with me because it is 
it has elements of the paranormal, but it's not just a paranormal case. This is a real study of family dynamics, uh, and, and the, the culture of the 80s as well, too, with the satanic panic that was going on. Yep. Yeah. It does. And to have a documentary where you have all the major players, these all these years later, the ones that are still alive, mom's passed away, dad's passed away. Mm. But to have all the brothers, the sister, uh, the murder suspect or the man in, uh, that that committed the murder, mm. uh, have them all sit down with you and talk about what was going on because you get wildly different stories, different interpretations of events too. Uh, yeah, and that was what the, the the kind of really interesting thing about the, the the film is that it's not we're not just selling this as a, a as a paranormal story. This is this is a really layered and complex case, and it's it's you know, it, and it is from the people that were there. You know, we we've, we've really tried to stick to the people that were on the ground and experienced this. We do go to the Warrens' grandson because obviously, like you say, the the Warrens have now passed over. Or passed on <laughs> the way you looked at it. Um, so this was the, that was the next best thing. But everybody involved in the story was actually there on the ground. They witnessed it for themselves, and they could tell their story for the very first time. You know, David uh, and Alan and Carl have never spoken before. Arnie has spoken, but the three brothers have never spoken about this, and and they didn't necessarily want to when we first started. You know, they didn't rush into it. You know, we really had to we had to sort of convince them. Um, you know, that this was a story that needed to be told properly. Right. And to tell that story, you had to sit down with all three of them and they give kind of different accounts of what, uh, what happened or what they think happened. You know, obviously David, the baby brother, he was 11 and 12 when all this was going down and he was the first focus of any kind of demonic, uh, infestation or oppression or possession, whatever you want to call it. He was kind of the, the first one to really feel these effects. And, and when you watch the show, he still maintains that something happened to him. He wasn't in his right mind. This wasn't a uh, teenage angst or anything like that. This was clearly something that happened to him. Uh, and then, then we talked to the middle brother, Alan, and he kind of co- cooperates some of that. You know, he, he feels like something was going on. He talks about uh, the, the events in the home. Um, there's great reenactments, too, yeah. of uh, the disturbances in the homes, the noise, poltergeist activity, whatever you want to call it. And then finally, Carl, the older brother, comes on, and he pretty much says, like, no, I don't believe any of this. Uh, <laughs> any of this stuff. So three members of the same family, all there at the same time, different interpretations of events. Yes. Yes. And that's what was so fascinating, really. Um, when we, when we got David, when David agreed to be filmed, we never knew until he sat down in the chair, which way he was going to go, whether he was on sort of team Allen or sort of team Carl. Um, so it was the very first question I asked him was, you know, were you, possessed or do you believe that you were possessed by the devil in the 1980s and he said yes and so we all kind of went okay so, so it's this set of questions and so then we really we really pursued that and really questioned him um we sat down for hours i think it was eight at least eight hours for over two days so two days so eight hours each day and really drilled into the case and exactly what happened david doesn't remember as much as his brother alan but he was younger and as he says, he sort of he blacked out. He had these sort of blackout periods during main, many of the sort of big events that happened. It seems to be a, it kind of hinted at in your documentary, too, with the three brothers, the three differences kind of of opinion or two against one. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of angst in talking about, well, the middle brother, Alan, he was uh, he hung out with mom. He didn't hang out with dad. He liked to bake cakes so I don't know if anything was kind of intimated there. You know, he's kind of disting himself from his brother a little bit too, kind of adding to um, the the kind of disconnect uh, brother-wise. Yeah, th- there is a disconnect in the family. Uh, primarily, to be honest with you, over the the possession. You know, that's that's their main angst is that um, Alan has always said it did happen and, and Carl has always said it didn't happen. So that's the main focus. And they're just, they're just, they're, as brothers, they're chalk and cheese. Carl and Alan are, are very different people. And then we have uh, the sister, the older sister, Debbie, who factors in uh, heavily into this documentary because it was her boyfriend, uh, a love triangle, something was going on uh, that uh, that led to this uh, this murder after an exorcism. Strange. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, so Glenn Cooper, the police officer that spoke about the case, um, 
we knew that there were some rumors about a, a love triangle, but it was Glenn Cooper that really put it into focus. And it, it, it's always a surprise when you sit down with somebody and interview them and, and they tell you these things and, and you, you it sort of connects the dots, really. Um, so was there something going on between Debbie and Alan? We don't know definitively, mm -hmm. but if Glenn Cooper is to be sort of uh, believed, then there was some relationship going on there. Although we did question Arnie. We asked Arnie that question, was there? And he said he categorically categorically denied it. That, that leads me to a question that I ask documentary filmmakers when I have them on the show. And when you are hired to be a writer, director, you've got this project that you're putting together, and then you finally sit down with the subjects for your interview, and they start spilling their guts. Do you ever get a little bit of angst? Do you ever like, oh my gosh, this is changing kind of like where I thought the documentary was going because whatever answer comes out of their mouth, you know, you have to kind of explore those avenues. You, you think an interview uh, might go in one direction, but then they, they might say something else that changes the focus of the documentary. Was there anything like that, eh, that, that, that you encountered? Yeah, you can't go into a film knowing exactly how it's going to come out. You know, you really can't because it isn't a work of fiction. It isn't a piece of scripted television. It's you have to be agile when you're in the room and listen to what they say and then and then re you know re question them on the answer that they've given. So there's always a little bit of the unknown. This was very very unknown because David and uh, Carl have really not sought the limelight at all and Arnie as well so we, we never really knew 100% what they were going to say we we knew the story but we didn't know what their version of the story is and we didn't know what filters it had been through in books and various films so when we sat down we didn't know which way it was going to go so yeah you have to think on your feet and and you know keep asking the questions and, and keep asking them to sort of to clarify things really. And that's what's so interesting is generally, I mean, I do believe that David believes that something really did happen in that house because when you sit down and question somebody for eight or nine hours and then the next day, eight or nine hours, the story changes, you know, it always changes. But with David, it never did. He was very clear on what happened and that didn't change. His answers didn't change over the two days. So which always tells me that that they are telling what they believe to be the truth. Um, so that was, that was interesting, you know. Now, this documentary is an hour and a half. I'm sure that you filmed hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And there was probably a longer cut and whatnot. And you have to decide what fits into the finished product what finish, uh, what contributes to the story, what kind of detracts from it. But one thing I found interesting, and I, and I might have to do my own research, is that all this happened when Debbie uh, moved into a, out of her house, the family house, into a, a kind of a rental house. And that's where, when the little brothers were in there helping clean up, is where the first uh, encounter with demonic, a demonic presence happened. Right. Was there any kind of... Um, investigation into why in that house at that time might have something attached itself? No, they, they obviously they did sort of inquire, but it, there was nobody that's alive still to talk about it because they were all kids. Yeah. So Debbie and her parents looked into it, but we couldn't really tell that story because we didn't have firsthand. It was very important that we told firsthand narrative. You know, we didn't want to sort of start using other people because obviously they put it through their filter and they reframe it. So in a way, it didn't really matter how, what the origin of this was. It was, it was really what happened from the point where um, David was in that back bedroom. And, and from then on, we tell the story, you know, because then we'd have to sort of prove that, if we did pursue that, we'd have to prove that there was something demonic or, or, and it's the kind of thing where Mike Allen said it best. He said, these paranormal cases are very, very difficult from a journalistic point of view because you can't prove them and you can't disprove them. So to sort of really try and find the origins of whatever that entity was would have been kind of impossible, I think. I thought that you did a good job of having um, kind of some insight into the churches, the Roman Catholic Church's procedure into investigating perceived uh, paranormal or demonic activity. And uh, I know I have some Catholic uh, priest friends, and they've shared with me uh, different forms that they use, questionnaires when people come to them with um, perceived demonic uh, presence in their in their home or in their in their life. And so I thought you did a great job of showing like, this isn't something that you just go into willy nilly, you know, like, oh, you think you're possessed here? We'll, we'll do this. There's a very mm -hmm. uh, regulated, regimented approach, a very, very um, studied, very calm 
um, procedure of going through and investigating this uh, on the, the church does before they ever go forward with any sort of uh, ritualistic uh, exorcism. Yeah, this, as Alan says in the film, to get an exorcism, there's an awful lot of paperwork that needs to be done. And it, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's humorous, you know. But it, it does, they don't take these things lightly and they don't, um, they don't offer up exorcisms like Canley. You know, it, it does take an awful lot of work because obviously people either str- are struggling mentally or there are other issues going on that they don't quite understand. So, so they, the Catholic Church needs to really drill down to do these people have a uh, some demonic presence in their lives and and therefore do we deal with it how do we deal with it so this went through weeks and weeks if not months of, of research and that's what that's where all the tapes come from that's where all the photographs come from is is the church or the warrens under the guidance of the church asking for this sort of evidence really um and you know thank goodness that these things exist because we wouldn't have much of a film if it's just he said, she said. Mm-hmm. What's so interesting is that we have those photographs and we have those audio tapes. And if you believe their possession, then they're fascinating. And if you don't, they're also evidence that they were all in some way or other faking, you know. Yeah, well, that's. I'm glad you brought up. I was going to bring up the uh, photographs and the tape recordings. That is worth the price of a Netflix subscription right there. All of the uh, the the Polaroid pictures that were taken during the exorcisms and during the encounters with the Warrens, uh, all of the tape recordings too. How who's in possession uh, of all that? How did you get possession? Huh? How did you get how did you get the uh, clearance or 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 to incorporate that evidence into the documentary? Who's in possession of that now? So uh, they belong to Judy Glatzel, and when Judy passed away. The, that material went to the oldest son, Carl Glatzel. Oh. Um, so it's his, it's his in his possession now. So he has all the tapes and he has all the photographs and the originals. He allowed us to to copy them and use them in the film. That's interesting that they that Carl is the one that's the custodian of all that, even though he doesn't believe in this stuff. He still hung on to it and just didn't throw it in the can. Yeah, I mean, like he says, though, he believes uh, he believes that it's evidence and proof that they're faking. You know, oh, so he goes oh. and he sees these tapes very differently to everybody else. Um, you know, that that's why he allowed us to share them because he was because they've never been shown in their entirety. And these are all the photographs that exist. There's no, there's not no others that sort of exist. So he allowed us to show all of them, and we played all of the tapes um, in the film. Um, but yeah, he has a very different perception of them, and that's what the film is about. Really, it's it's the three brothers have well, two brothers have the same idea of what happened, mm-hmm. but it's about different perceptions about the same event that happened. Yeah. Different perceptions of the same kind of shared reality. It's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That I have to think about that for a second. So that's interesting. I didn't know if the, um, the Warrens, since they made the uh, cassette recordings, if they kept on uh, with them, they didn't but- make them. No, they didn't make them. So they instructed the family to make them because they weren't there all the time. Uh, so this was this was uh, done by the family when the Warrens weren't present. And then the family would play them to the Warrens and and the various priests that attended the house. Um, and, and that was their evidence that they weren't making it up, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, how did you get in contact with Chris McKinnell, the grandson to Ed and Lorraine? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't answer that because it was my producer that that found uh, them. So I'm not quite sure. Uh, I had an amazing producer who could find anybody in a, you know, <laughs> she could literally, <laughs> a needle in a haystack. Um, she found Chris and uh, she found Father Max as well. Yeah. Well, and, and Chris was very forthcoming. He was, um, he, he sat down and, and defended their legacy the best he could because uh, it is a complicated legacy. Some people, like I told you before the interview started, that there's some in the paranormal community that think that N. Lorraine did wonderful work and helped a lot of people. And a lot of people in the paranormal community think that N. Lorraine helped themselves to as much money and fame as they were able to to get from uh, these uh, from these cases. So I think the answer is very complicated and they're not here to defend themselves. But you did find Chris uh, to give their side of the story and to talk about like their procedures and everything that they did. Yeah. Chris was, was interesting. He, and he was really close to his grandparents. Um, he, he was raised pretty much by Ed and Lorraine. Um, and yeah, they, they're, they're a very close family, you know, the Tony, the, the son-in-law who 
runs the estate now, didn't want to be involved in the documentary, um, but Chris wanted to sort of step forward and, and speak up for his for his grandparents. And yeah, he was he was interesting. It was interesting also uh, kind of, and I'm not giving too much away, like everybody, when you're watching this, it's an hour and a half documentary that that is so well put together. And we're talking about it here shortly uh, or in a short amount of time, but it, we're not giving away too much. But when you uh, kind of flip the script a little bit and we start talking about Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, the boyfriend of Debbie, uh, and and his involvement later with with uh, kind of um, it's described as transmigration of this evil presence from young David to Arnie in the middle of this exorcism. He kind of says, "Come on to me, come on to me. Don't don't be on the little kid. Come, you know, take me on." And that's when the things uh, changed. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's the interesting thing. That's another point when we were talking to Father Max was we didn't know about transmigration when we sat down to talk to him about it. And and I just said, you know, come on, this is this is this is ridiculous. There's you know, and he said, actually, no, it is in the literature that that if you attend uh an exorcism, then then I don't want to give too much away, but transmigration, and you need to watch the film to sort of find out what that is, can actually happen. And it's one of those wow moments when you go. Okay, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. You know, it's got some basis in in sort of Christian tradition. You know, it's not necessarily fact, but it is something that is that is in the Christian and Christian tradition. So we got a murder that happens. Uh, perceived perhaps a love triangle. Very strange circumstances. I really uh, enjoyed like watching and and listening to the strategy that was developed by Martin Manella, the attorney, and sitting down with him. It's great. It's, it's, it's crazy to see people, how they change over the years. And so you see this young, uh, this young attorney, nobody wants to take this case. They tell him he's crazy for taking this case. And he tries his very best to incorporate this, uh, the devil made me do it defense. But then uh, having all these years later, Martin Manella, the attorney, uh, give his account of trying to defend this, uh, this murder case. Incredible. Yeah. Fascinating. Another that's the, I've got the best job in the world sometimes when you do meet these people and you just go, wow, you know, you're a piece of history. There's, there's all, there's this world surrounding this case. And then you actually meet the people who are really involved. And, and Marty was really a great person to speak to. And, you know, he's not a young man anymore, but he was so kind of laser focused in, in knowing what happened and why the reasons why he did what he did. One of the interesting things somebody said to me, why didn't um, Marty Manelli once the, the defense was, questioned why didn't he just plead insanity and he and he said he wasn't insane you know he, he wasn't insane so why would i do that and you go oh, okay you know so yeah marty was an interesting guy and and fascinating what was it like he got inundated oh. with uh, he was inundated after the case and still to this day he still gets calls asking for people to asking by people asking him to represent them uh, in the similar types of cases where people feel possessed and they may act unlawfully uh, not necessarily murder, but but he is still the guy the guy to go to. And to sit down all these years later with uh, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, the man that was uh, convicted, not a first degree murder, but of manslaughter in the death of Alan Bono. Um, to sit down with him, he seems incredibly kind of at peace with uh, you know how his life has kind of turned out. He's uh, he seems to be very religious, and he seems to think that uh, there was evil afoot and but he seems to have been making peace and seems very um settled in 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 his life now yes he is a, a really sort of quietly spoken gentle man um really you know not the angry not the, the sort of murderer that you you know spoken about one thing you should clarify as well is that i keep reading newspaper reports saying that that alan uh, was stabbed 20 odd times. It, it, he wasn't stabbed 20 times. Arnie did stab him and did kill him, but he was uh, stabbed five times. Mm. And so, it, you know, but uh, he's not the the sort of mad murderer that, that uh, you know, that, that's written about. He did commit a terrible crime. Um, he did go to, to prison for it. And, and he's sort of since then turned his life around. He married Debbie, um, has led a, a kind of clean, had a clean slate ever since then, not been convicted of anything else. And now has a very responsible job in the construction industry. And yeah, very not to the person that's, that was back in the 1980s or 1990 that, that killed Alan Pono. 
In your research and in working on this film, did you hear much from uh, from Alan's family about this is bullshit or this is that or, or anything like that? No, we did approach Alan's family. We did ask them for comments, and they didn't want to be take part in the in the documentary. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. You know, uh, but even without their involvement, I think he told a very complete picture of of the circumstances before the murder, the murder, the trial. And, uh, just, a, it's just a strange, um, uh, strange case in the annals of American law and, and, uh, and courtrooms and legal justice. It is, it's really unique. You know, it's such a unique story and to have so many layers to it, you know, the sort of the possession, the murder and, and the defense is, it, it's a one-off, you know, I, I, that's what's so interesting about it. And it's so layered and it, it's incredibly complex. And we've tried to navigate a way through it that is, that is fair. And I think, um, you know, like I said before, we're not trying to turn believers into non-believers and we're not trying to turn non-believers into believers. You know, we're, we're just laying out the facts as we found them and, um, and, you know, analyze those facts and then lay out the facts as we found them. Did your um, views on this change, like when you started the documentary versus like now you've got the final cut? I mean, did you see things like, well, I think it's kind of kind of go this way. And then like, oh, did you turn yourself from a skeptic to a believer or from a believer to a skeptic? Or <laughs> No, I mean, I've, I've always been a skeptic, but I was raised very similar to the Glatzer boys, you know, one of three brothers in a very, very Catholic household. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was raised believing in devils and demons and God and you know, I'm, I'm now, I'm an atheist now, but I was, um, I, I was a skeptic and I still am, mm -hmm. you know, I still am a skeptic, but I, but I w wanted to treat the, the family with real respect and I didn't want to come in with my views and force that on them. I just wanted them. It's not about what I believe. It's about what David believes and what Alan believes and what Carl believes. And I think, I do think we've, we've represented that fairly. I hope I have. I would agree with that. I think you uh, kind of presented a story and let it unfold in their own words, and you used the incredible photography that there was that was captured during those uh, uh, exorcisms, uh, and, and the the audio is very compelling uh, in a mm. lot of ways. Because what makes it compelling to me too is like you know I I am I'm Catholic, and mm. uh, I've had uh, an American exorcist by the name of Monsignor Stephen Rossetti on the show and talking about his book and his experiences. And I've talked to my Catholic priest friends and they've told me stories and everything. So if we're, if these things aren't real, if there is no such thing as devil possession. If there's no such thing as monsters and ghosts and all that stuff, then another interesting thing to kind of consider is why after all these centuries that human beings still think this is happening. Like, what is it about us? If it's not real, what is it about us that that conjures up these uh, scenarios if they're not real? Exactly, it is fascinating. Uh, you know, I do, I wish I had the answer. I don't, but <laughs> but I, yeah, it is. It is endlessly fascinating. You know, I mean, we when I was a young boy, we had a priest who wasn't an exorcist, but as close as you could possibly get. And the stories he told, I, I really believe them, and I believe that he believed them. Um, so where does this come from? You know. Why do people believe this? Why do people see things they see? And and it comes down to faith, essentially. Mm. Is you either have faith that these things exist and are real or, or you don't. And and that's the interesting thing about this particular story is it's based in it's it's people's faith, really. Well, I really enjoyed watching it. And uh, I thought you did a great job. Like I said, I was familiar with the case before, but not on this level, especially in such an intimate level with the uh, involvement of the family and the uh, the police officer and the attorney and uh, just uh, you even had some archive footage from uh, from the sister, from Debbie. W w where did that archive footage come from? That was an interview done uh, way back in the 1970s. I think they they appeared very briefly in a in a documentary, and we were given access to um, the rushes for that. So we used we used that um, because unfortunately Debbie died just as we were going into production. Um, my producer spoke to her um, in the first few weeks of production. And then she passed away. Um, so yeah, we we obviously couldn't speak to her. We didn't we didn't know if Arnie was would be ready to speak um, because you know obviously he was heartbroken uh, about his his wife. But yeah, they they were over twenty years. Yeah, and they got married in prison while he was still serving time uh, for this so amazing photographs in prison. That they, they are my favorite. <laughs> they are incredible. I know. I'm yeah. surprised they. I was like, wow, they let him pin a boutonniere on. You know, you always think like. Uh, 
you know, prison contraband and shivs and, you know, things like that. But no, he was able to pin a boutonniere on his prison issued <laughs> uniform or, or clothing there. So yeah, you covered all the bases. Uh, it, it was, it was extraordinary. And I'm, I'm super, uh, uh, appreciative of having this opportunity to talk to a filmmaker, um, about it. Cause I talked to a lot of people in the paranormal and I've talked to Catholic mm. priests and I've talked to people that, that have experienced these things, or they've said that they've experienced these things, but to talk to, uh, an accomplished filmmaker who, uh, is celebrating this release. It just came out today as we're talking yes. and, uh, yeah, it's very good. and it looks like you're on the next project out there in Scotland. Yes, I am. I am. I'm, uh, yeah, just doing some scripted work at the moment. Nice. Nice. Well, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me today to talk about this. And, and I really want everybody, uh, to have an open mind and to everybody in the world has got a Netflix uh, subscription. So turn on your Netflix mm -hmm. and pull up, uh, the devil on trial. It just dropped today as we're talking October 17th, Tuesday, uh, in the United States. I I'm sure that's the same release date worldwide. So, yeah. So watch it and ex experience the, uh, the filmmaking style of my guest, Chris Holt. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to meet you. Well, there we go, everybody. Episode 261, The Devil on Trial with filmmaker Christopher Holt. So great to have Christopher on the show all the way out there in Scotland right now through the modern marvel, miracle of technology, bringing him and I together and bringing you in as well. I'd like to give a shout out to Dennis and his wife, Jerry Ann, for supporting the Necronomicast by buying me a few cups of coffee since the last episode aired. Thank you so much, Dennis and Jerry Ann. Hope to see you again in our travels investigating Bigfoot. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy a t-shirt. You can buy me a cup of coffee. All this uh, support goes to support creatives who have agreed to be on the show. Whenever people are on the show, I've bought in their book, I've watched their movie, I've supported their projects. So thank you for supporting Necronomicast. Hope you had a wonderful Halloween season. Thanksgiving is soon upon us as is the next episode of Necronomicast. Episode 262 will feature the producers of the television show that I'm on, Murder in the 21st, airing on A&E. So catch up on the show, Murder in the 21st, and then tune in to the Necronomicast for my conversation with two of the producers. Thanks for everything. Love you all. Goodbye.